My name is Michael Adler from the Wilson Center, and you've asked me to moderate this excellent panel, so it's a great honor for me to be here. The subject today is the Tehran Agreement, which was struck in uh, May 2010. And I just want to give a brief history of how we got there, and the panelists will discuss what it means for the different nations. But as you know, the Iranian nuclear crisis began in 2002 when two secret sites were revealed and in Iran, a uh, enrichment plant and a heavy water plant. And then in 2003, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is the UN nuclear Watch watchdog, started to investigate Iranian nuclear activities. And it was discovered that they had uh, some two decades of activities that hadn't been reported as they were required to do under the safeguards agreement for the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. At the same time that the IA was investigating Iran's past and present nuclear activities, an intense uh, round of diplomacy began, with at first the Europeans taking the lead, and then the United States getting involved, and then the United Nations getting more heavily involved with sanctions, in an effort to get Iran to um, fully comply with its safeguards agreement and to get Iran to um, cooperate fully with the uh, IAEA investigation. And this has been a long and torturous process, and there has been a search throughout to find a compromise through which uh, Iran could make a confidence building gesture, which would lead to negotiations. And uh, things were not going well. There was a lot of stalemate. I won't go through the Bush and Obama administrations, but basically the Bush administration was more confrontational, moved towards a less confrontational approach to Iran that didn't bear any fruit. And then the Obama administration came in seeking engagement. In October 2009, there was a meeting. It was the resuming talks, which had been broken off at this point for a while. And there was a great surprise at this meeting. A formula was reached, which many people felt and feel is the, was, a, was the ideal compromise to get the process going. And the compromise involved was a fuel swap, where Iran would ship out most of the lower rich uranium it had made, and it would ship it out to a third country, then it would be processed into fuel for a research reactor in Tehran, which makes medical isotopes, and for which fuel is running out. Um, Iran agreed to this deal, it was a meeting in October 2009, in, uh, in Geneva, and at this meeting they agreed to the fuel swap where they would ship out uh, 1,200 kilograms of low rich uranium, which was almost all of their stockpile at the time. They agreed to allow for inspection of a site that had recently been discovered in Rome, which was uh, where they were building an enrichment plant, and they agreed to move towards talks on the nuclear issue. But the most exciting part of this was this compromise agreement because it would have uh, put Iran in a situation where it would not have enough uranium to make an atomic weapon. It would strip out most of the LEU. And at the same time, a great bonus for Iran was that it would have been able to continue in the direct uranium. So many people felt it was a tacit acceptance of their ability, of their enriching. The agreement fell apart. There was a meeting in Vienna uh, that month. The, the agreement fell apart. And Spinning forward to, um, uh, to May 2010, Turkey and Brazil got involved in diplomacy trying to save the agreement, trying to get Iran to, to agree to it. Um, they reached an agreement in Tehran in May, that was Turkey, Brazil, and Iran, that Iran would ship out 1,200 kilograms and that they would agree to store the uranium in a third country. Um, so it looks superficially like the deal that was struck in um, October, but there were differences. The differences was that Iran had begun emission rating to 20% on its own. Uh, that was, because they said, if you're not going to use the fuel for the reactor, we're going to make the fuel. And um, uh, they had also continued emission rating, so their stockpile was larger. So the United States had problems with it, with the agreement, because uh, it represented less of their stockpile, because they were emission to 20%. And also, uh, the agreement that was struck in Tehran 
was not the final agreement because it still had to be agreed by a, a group called the, the Vienna Group, which had been discussing the original agreement, October 2009, in Vienna, and it had fallen apart, and the U.S. position was you had to come back to that. Now, different opinions on it and points of view will be presented by the panelists. I'm just trying to give you a rough uh, run-up to what the situation was. The panelists we have, on my left is Barbara Slater, who is a former journalist, as I am, a journalist, and recovering journalist. journalist. And Barbara uh, is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's South Asia Center. She is an expert on U.S. foreign policy and the author of a 2007 book on Iran entitled Bitter Friends, Muslim Enemies, Iran, United States, and Tristan Confrontation. Truth in Advertising, Barbara was also at the Wilson Center, so we're colleagues of Sue. Next to Barbara is Kandir Usu. He's a research director at the Center Foundation here in Washington, D.C. He received his MA degree in history from Bill Kent University. He is currently pursuing a doctoral degree in Middle East Studies at Columbia University. Mr. Hussain has taught numerous undergraduate classes on history, politics, culture, and art in the Islamic world, as well as Western political thought at Columbia University and George Mason University. On my right is Peter Parsi, a man who needs no introduction. He is one of the most active people in uh, bringing the Iranian point of view forth to policymakers in Washington. He is founder and president of the National Iranian American Council and an expert on U.S. Iranian <coughs> relations, Iranian politics, and the balance of power in the Middle East. He has written a book called Treacherous Alliance, The Secret Dealings of Iran, Israel, and the United States. And he will be having a new book coming out on Obama and Palestine. Correct. Next to um, Trita is Matthias Spector, who is an assistant professor at the Getulio Vargas Foundation in Brazil, where he directs the Center for International Relations and runs an international relations book series. And Matthias is working on an incredible research project on exactly this subject and the diplomacy went into it with a lot of original documents. He's also published a book on Kissinger in Brazil and he's a really outstanding scholar. So now Barbara, if you would explain the US position. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks for giving that uh, that overview. I'm gonna try not to, to repeat too much of the background, but in, in my view, the, uh, the Turkish-Brazilian diplomacy of last year was a noble effort that uh, was basically doomed to fail because the Obama administ administration strategy coming in uh, had been to give Iran a year to agree to a confidence-building measure. There was a lot of congressional pressure, there was Israeli pressure to uh, show progress on the nuclear front by the end of 2009. And if that didn't happen, then Obama made it quite clear he was going to pivot towards sanctions, and that's exactly what he did. It took a lot of work to get support for a new UN Security Council resolution, a very, very tough one, as you know. And the, while the US encouraged Turkey and Brazil to, to keep making efforts with, with Iran after this tentative deal collapsed uh, in the fall of 2009, um, the deal itself, as Michael pointed out, was not sufficient uh, when the Tehran Declaration came out. It would have been less than 50% of Iran's known stockpile of LEU that would have been sent out, uh, and uh, obviously that wasn't sufficient. Um, and the timing of it, it, it was announced on the eve, practically, of, of a UN vote, just shortly before the UN votes. So it was seen in Washington as a very transparent ploy on the part of the Iranians to stave off another sanctions resolution, uh, not as a sincere or serious effort to begin resolving the nuclear dispute. As Michael pointed out, uh, by May of, of 2010, uh, Iran had considerably more uh, low-enriched uranium. This particular confidence-building measure that was first proposed in October 2009 was reintroduced in January of this year when we had the last talks uh, of the P5 plus one and the Iranians in Istanbul. And uh, at that time, the US uh, and its partners asked Iran to give up 2,800 kilograms, more than twice as many kilograms of low enriched uranium, which would have been about 90% of the Iranian stockpile at that time. And all of the uranium that the Iranians had enriched, enriched to 20% in uh, 235, it was about 40 kilograms at that time. Now I think it's up to 60 or more. Where are we now? Neither side is showing uh, any flexibility. 
The United States and its partners are, uh, while they might tacitly concede an Iranian right to enrich through this confidence building measure, they are not prepared to say up front that Iran has a right to enrich uranium provided it abides by uh, the NPT, allows very stringent mon monitoring of its program and so on. This is something that is being held out there as a potential concession, but it's not there now. And Iran has made it clear in Istanbul most recently that this is a precondition for serious negotiations. It wants the rest of the world to say, yes, you have a right to the complete nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, the domestic political situation in Iran now is extremely complicated, and it makes concessions of any kind, I think, very unlikely. There was a piece in the New York Times today, I don't know how many of you saw it, suggesting that Ahmadinejad was our last best hope for a nuclear deal. Frankly, I don't understand the logic of that. I think Ahmadinejad and his people have been very eager to, to engage, to sort of create a process that will make them look important and make them look like they are considered as real interlocutors of the West, but I don't think they're interested in, 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 uh, in a serious outcome. The nuclear issue has become a signature issue for Ahmadinejad. Uh, he stresses it constantly. Um, he talks about the program being a, a car with no reverse gear and no brakes. Um, he has done a sort of pivot from Islamic purity to Iranian nationalism in recent years in an attempt to try to bolster his, his uh, very much discredited presidency after the 2009 elections. And so to give up this program or to make any substantial concessions uh, on the nuclear front uh, would take away the one thing that he can point to as, a, as a, an example of progress uh, in his program uh, of, of asserting Iran. Um, as I mentioned, the 2009 elections that were supposed to consolidate Ahmadinejad's presidency instead of undermine them. We have this terrible fight going on now between Ahmadinejad and his close advisors and the supreme leader. Uh, I think that uh, even if he might want still some sort of process with the U.S., it's very hard to imagine how we, we have a deal or, or serious negotiations. Um, a U.S. official that I uh, am in communication with talked about political paralysis in, in Tehran as being the main reason why nothing was going forward, but I think it's also fair to say that there's a complete lack of initiative in Washington, at least on the negotiations front. Having tried engagement, having checked that box, we are now completely in sanctions mode, and the only thing that the U.S. and the P5 plus one are talking about these days is how to tighten sanctions. Uh, how to, to make them bite even more, how to focus on things like human rights, which are seen as a new vulnerability for Iran, particularly in the context of the uh, Arab Spring. There's not even, even any effort to talk to Iran about other issues, such as Afghanistan, where there are some mutual interests that can be explored. On the United States side, obviously the U.S. is preoccupied with its own domestic uh, problems in terms of the region. It's got Egypt and Tunisia to help transition to democracy. It's got very difficult uh, situations in Libya, uh, Yemen, and Bahrain, and of course Obama is preparing for his re-election bid, and uh, there is no domestic percentage in presenting some new offer to Iran, I and mean, he got slammed badly enough for what he did try back in 2009. So I don't think we can see anything on the U.S. side, at least until after our uh, presidential elections. Um, as for Turkey and Brazil, uh, our, our other speakers, of course, will talk about that, but I think both of them got burned by the Tehran Declaration when they saw the reaction of the West uh, and what happened after the UN Security Council vote. Uh, Turkey certainly has other things to worry about as well, uh, internal issues with Kurds and a new constitution and, and the Syria crisis, uh, which is putting at odds with Tehran, which, of course, is trying to shore up the Assad regime. Um, I think the only hope for a way out of this, and I've written about this for the Atlantic Council. We have a, a new report up on our website, acus.org, uh, and that is to get China much more active in terms of nuclear diplomacy, because China really has clout with Iran. It's the biggest trading partner of Iran now, biggest investor in the Iranian energy sector, and uh, I guess Hu Jintao read our brief because just this past week, actually, he had some words with the um, with the Iranians and uh, told Ahmadinejad at a meeting of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization that they must take quote-unquote substantial steps 
to establish trust and uh, promote dialogue on the nuclear issue. So I think working on the China angle uh, is probably our best hope right now, but it's still very hard to see much progress going forward. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you for uh, joining this panel. Um, I, I, I will be focusing on the Turkish foreign policy and how Turkish foreign policy uh, diplomats, um, the prime minister, foreign minister, etc., perceived this issue and what the logic was back then for uh, trying to break that deal. Um, so it had to do broadly with the Turkey's neighborhood policy, which was based on a couple of things. Um, economic and political integration, free flow of goods and services, and a proactive diplomacy in the international scene. Turkey had specific incentives to try to break it, uh, achieve a breakthrough in the Iran nuclear issue. First has to do with Turkey's own security concerns. Turkey would suffer directly from escalation of the standoff between Iran and the international community. Turkey feared paying the price of such an escalation as it did during the two wars uh, in Iraq. The lesson drawn from Iraq was that international pre pressure and the um, sanctions route would lead to regional tension, military action, and eventual war. Um, Iraq wars were very costly for Turkey's security and for its economic interests. In that sense, I think Turkey's sensitivity over the Iraq war is underappreciated. And this, another thing, Turkish appetite for <laughs> resolution of the nuclear issue was very strong. But Turkey argues that it's not possible to achieve Iranian compliance through pressure and sanctions. Sanctions for Turkey are not only ineffective, but counterproductive. They undermine the very logic of negotiations. They hurt the people a lot more than the regime and sanctions run counter to regional economic integration which Turkey perceives as essential for its foreign policy. The conviction that diplomatic track had not been exhausted was another strong incentive for Turkey. Turkey wanted to use its position as a non-permanent member of the UNSC at the time to raise its diplomatic profile as a regional player. There's no doubt that there was political gain for Turkey in acting as a serious negotiator um, um, through brokering the Tehran deal, Turkey wanted to demonstrate that it could act as a serious deal maker in the region. Um, another issue incentive was that um, was the idea of a nuclear free WMD free zone in the Middle East. Um, deal with Iran would help achieve that goal, in the long run at least. And in criticizing um, the international community on its position vis-a-vis -vis, um, Israel's nuclear capabilities, Turkey made the argument that Iranian cooperation could be sustained in, in the long run only if Israel is part of the nuclear free zone as well. So this was clearly not a favorable position in Washington. Also, Turkey um, does not uh, favor monopolization of nuclear uh, energy production processes. So at that level, Turkey does recognize uh, Iran's right to enrich just as uh, other um, countries uh, signatory to the MPT, um, but, and it's not, Turkey's not afraid to say so, um, and admit it <laughs> on the, in the written paper, the Tehran Declaration. Um, so it, 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 uh, it's in line with its foreign policy uh, perspective. For the Tehran deal, as you know, was rejected uh, by the US administration for not being comprehensive, and failing to satisfy the main concerns of the international community. Um, one thing Turkish side was frustrated about was that this nuclear swap deal was precisely a confidence building measure. It was never meant to be a comprehensive solution in the first place. And Turkey never claimed 
that it was. Turkey met the rejection of the deal with a certain degree of surprise and frustration. Um, the no vote at the Security Council was partly the result of this frustration. Rejection of the Tehran deal showed us that there was in fact not a lot of room for uh, maneuvering for the U.S. administration. This contrasts with the Turkish government's position. Turkey would be directly influenced by escalation in the Iran nuclear issue, but at the same time, Turkish foreign policy activism is a lot less constrained by domestic political struggles. Domestic public support for the Turkish foreign policy made it easier for Turkey to reach out to Iranians. However, the Turkish leadership also would not be willing to spend political capital on the issue um, if it didn't see a political gain out of it in terms of its international role, etc. Uh, but it was on an easier footing domestically, I would say. Um, the no vote at the UNSC uh, fueled the various Turkey headed and who lost Turkey debates in Washington. Um, there were even those who argued that Turkey should be punished. Um, relations were strained and Turkey had to, uh, was put in a position to explain itself why it voted no, etc. Um, one reason provided for the no vote was that Turkey would stand behind the Tehran deal and keep the diplomacy track open. The result was that there was another five P5 P5 plus one Iran meeting in Istanbul last fall, which wasn't, uh, which didn't, um, you know, succeed much. Uh, but the, Turkey did not take a mediator role, but it was significant that the meeting took place in Istanbul. And the Iranian side still says this, that, you know, they can meet through Turkey. So Turkey, in that sense, achieved its uh, perhaps relatively small goal of being a sort of reliable negotiator, mediator. <coughs> um, Turkey had to also deal with the perception that it supported Iran's efforts to avoid its international obligations. This was a serious problem for the U.S.-Turkey relations um, because Turkey says it doesn't. Uh, it wants Iran to abide by the international obligations, but the way to achieve that uh, should be diplomacy and diplomacy only, not other tracks, because other tracks would undermine it. And um, obviously, Iran topped the agenda in the U.S. foreign policy uh, in debates, and it still does, even after the Arab Spring. Um, so, for many, Turkey seemed like interfering with U.S. efforts to achieve Iranian compliance. This perception, however, downplays Turkey's stake in the Iran nuclear issue. Turkey seeks improved relations with Iran, but it's also equally um, anxious about Iran's nuclear program. It doesn't want nuclear weapons uh, to be developed uh, and other country, countries aspiring to do just that. And lastly, I think there's room, Turkey did quite a bit of uh, explaining in the aftermath, but uh, uh, to, there's still room for U U.S. and Turkey to cooperate on this issue. Turkey will be much more careful, obviously, in its efforts, but um, as promised by the newly elected, re-elected Prime Minister Erdogan, Turkey is looking to be more active in the region, even more than before. So I do not think that the issue will remain outside Turkey's foreign policy agenda, as perhaps um, some U.S. diplomats would like. But on the contrary, overcoming the nuclear <coughs> impasse will have to involve a serious Turkish contribution. I think uh, China. Uh, I mean, you have Turkey as a very good partner in so many issues. I think that would be a roundabout way of going about it. I understand the logic. Um, lastly, Syria, what's happening in Syria, um, may put, may complicate issues for uh,
Turkish-Iranian relations, and you know, you might expect tension uh, emerging from there. But we we'll, we will see what Turkey, how Turkey readjusts uh, its position on the nuclear issue. I don't see it's going to make a huge change because of such a uh, tension. Thank you. And you, thank you. I just like to point out I was in Istanbul for the meeting. Uh, and Turkish diplomats. Mike, could you uh, Sorry, I was in uh, Istanbul well, for the microphone meeting. Microphone closer, please. Is that that? Uh, um, I was in Istanbul for the meeting, and uh, Turkish diplomats were very active behind the scenes in trying to get the two sides together. It didn't work out, but Turkey continued to play a very valuable diplomatic role. I, I just spoke to a diplomat who said to me, We were just hosting, but we were hosting actively. <laughs> very, very actively. And, and with the uh, full support of the United States. Um, Mateus? Right, excellent, thanks. Um, so, if, as Barbara said, the agreement was doomed to fail because the Obama administration had been sending all the right signals, um, why did the Brazilians do it? There are two major sources of interpretation. One outside Brazil, here in the United States, and one inside Brazil. The interpretation here in the US um, is best um, characterized by a quote from, I can't remember whether it's the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal, saying that Lula was really Ahmadinejad's idiot, useful idiot. Um, you know, this was a ploy by the Iranians to stave off yet another round of sanctions, and the Iranians were so skillful at manipulating Brazil that managed to get Brazil on board because the Brazilians were just sitting. This resonates with the Brazilian critique on the opposition against Lula at the time, and we have to take into account we were at, uh, at a presidential race at the time. And the critique says, well, yes, Lula was an idiot. Secondly, he had dreams. He thought he could unseat Ban Ki-moon and take Ban Ki-moon's position someday. And that critique also says uh, that Lula is just plainly anti-American. So whatever the Iranians were ready to, to do, Brazil was ready to support. Now, if we want to understand what happened, I think we need to try and attempt a little exercise in empathy, you know, put ourselves in the shoes of Brazilians making decisions at the time and try and see the world through their eyes. We'll only be able to do this properly in 15 years' time when all the documents come out. Uh, but let's try. So what I'll try to do is give you a list of things that I reckon help explain why the Brazilians did what they did better than either the <coughs> Washington Post, Wall Street Journal interpretation of Lula's idiocy and the interpretation of the Brazilian opposition at the time. So the first thing is Brazil used to be even worse than Iran. It had a secret nuclear program. For a long time, Brazil was the MPT's critic number two after India. And then in the 1990s, Brazil signs on to the MPT, but not only signs on to the MPT, it begins to develop a really very active nuclear diplomacy. So Brazil is a founding member of the New Agenda Coalition since 1998. It's a member of the Nuclear Provider Group. It signs on to all the agreements controlling missile technology. It presided the disarmament conference in 2000. It presided the NPT review conference in 2005. It presided the international fissile materials conference in 2007. And critically, Brazil begins to develop the argument that it is a responsible stakeholder within the NPT. That the countries that are failing the NPT are those countries that are not living up to chapter six of the NPT, saying disarmament and that Brazil will not sign on to the additional protocols, not because Brazil has anything to hide, but because if Brazil signs on to the additional protocols, then the disarmed countries will have no tool to push and shove the nuclear countries to disarm. So that's the background and that's the context. And when Obama comes and begins to signal that there might be something shifting in American nuclear policy, towards a greater emphasis on disarmament, the Brazilians don't believe it. The second point by the Brazilians is the same as the Turks. 
sanctions are counterproductive and are ineffective. But the Brazilians went even farther than the Turks. The Brazilians actually said the problem with sanctions is that they will toughen the regime. They are really counterproductive. The third argument, and this is rather crucial, the Brazilians thought that in the context of the American presidential race with, when one of the leading candidates was singing Bombi Ran, sanctions were a prelude to intervention. And we had seen sanctions leading to intervention in the case of Iraq. And very importantly, the foreign minister of Brazil in 2009 and 10 is the same man who presided over the Iraq panels in the UN in the run-up to the first Iraq war. So that's really quite important. The other argument was that the NPT had a major problem around 2010. It lacked legitimacy. And it lacked legitimacy because the United States and Europe had, be, had made the big mistake of rewarding India. India had never signed on to the NPT, had attacked the NPT through and through, and in 2008, India got the agreement it always wanted. It was rewarded by Washington for not signing up to the NPT. And that, the Brazilians argued, produced a crisis of legitimacy at the heart of the NPT. So the last thing you want to do is get an NPT member like Iran and hit it as hard as you can. There was a moral argument attached to it. And the moral argument was that Brazil is the only BRIC country that willingly relinquished the possibility of, of a nuclear weapon. And that from that position, Brazil could speak to the Iranians in ways that no other country could, with the exception of Turkey. So the implicit argument there is that the Brazilians, because of their history, can empathize with the Iranians, can understand what drives the Iranians. And they can also be sold by the Iranian regime to the Iranian public opinion as a country that is supportive of the quest for technological autonomy. Now, what about the anti-American argument? Is Lula an anti-American? When we look at it in detail, no. Anti-Americanism is not a driving force. Brazil has been one of the countries that has benefited most from collective security post-1945, as we know it. And I know it sounds strange here in Washington now, but Lula was actually thinking that in pursuing the Tehran Declaration, he was facilitating things. There had been a letter sent by the White House to Brazil, and fair enough, the letter was not clear. I mean, you can see many hands behind the letter. There was the White House and the State Department and DOD. And yes, Lula read the letter the way he wanted to read it. He read the bit that said, Dear Mr. President Lula, we will welcome your initiative. And he didn't read the other bit. But I think there's something to say to the goodwill of the Brazilians at the time who thought they could actually get something uh, done. What did we learn inside Brazil about the Tehran Declaration? We learned that environments of low mutual trust require very deep communication. The big problem for Brazil, and this was the, Brazil's biggest mistake, is that Brazil had no communications with Washington, with Tehran, or with Ankara. I mean, the notion that on the eve of the event, the Brazilians did not know whether Erdogan was coming, and they had no way to know whether he was coming. The notion that the Obama letter to Lula got mixed up, ended up being leaked by the Brazilian government to the press, breaking, bringing the relationship, the bilateral relationship, down to its lowest point in many, many years, only speaks of the lack of established channels for communication between Brasilia and Washington. And the same goes for Tehran. I mean, the most interesting thing about listening to the people involved on the Brazilian side now, when they recollect what happened, is how little they knew about Tehran, how little access they had to the Iranians. Even if their gut feeling, I think, was correct, and their gut feeling was, 
that if there's anyone or better, if there was anyone in May 2010 with whom you could speak to in Tehran, that was Ahmadinejad. If you wanted to do business, he was the man who could engage with you. Not because he was to the left of the others, but because he was in a mindset that could produce that. What's the cost? Barbara, I agree entirely with what she said. Brazil got burned. Um, anecdotal evidence has it that on the date of the vote in the UN Security Council, the Brazilian ambassador to New York had two different votes on her hand, an abstention and a no, and she waited on the mobile phone to know. And the reason why she waited is because President Obama spoke with Lula for about 40 minutes, asking him, pushing him quite hard actually, to abstain, and Lula considered the possibility, and then Lula phoned up Ahmadinejad, and Ahmadinejad had power in his hand, because Ahmadinejad said, well, if you abstain, then tomorrow morning I will denounce the Tehran Declaration. And then the whole cost of the performance would fall on Lula and on Erdogan. So in that sense, yes, Ahmadinejad managed to play uh, Lula. Lula played, uh, paid a very high cost domestically. The uh, Middle Eastern foreign policy of the Lula years, it's incredibly active. The foreign minister visited the Middle East 24 times in 80 years. Lots of agreements, not just with Iran or the Lebanon, but also and very significantly with Israel. This is important to highlight. Brazil's relationship with Israel remained really pretty good throughout, and it remains pretty good today. But that side of foreign policy had to be toned down very dramatically when the new president was elected, President Rousseff, Lula's successor and close friend. She then began to abandon the Iran file uh, very clearly. She made uh, a number of statements saying that she was not planning to pick it up again. But more significantly, she approved a uh, resolution in the UN um, Human Rights Council allowing for the setup of a special report on the human rights situation inside uh, 